All right. Um, I'll now call to order the order. City County Council meeting from Monday, April the 13th, 2020. Before I start, um, before we move on to the rest of the business this evening, I ask that you enjoin me in remembering IMPD officer Brianne Lee. I know that our entire city, including each of you, has keenly felt the loss of Officer Leith, a young mother who proudly served both her country and her hometown. She represented the best of what we as a community can be. And her death was a tragedy, but her life is an inspiration. We honor her by, by by embracing her example of enthusiastic service, unflinching sacrifice, and unwavering courage. Let us pause for a moment of silence to remember Officer Lee and honor all our brave law enforcement and first responders tonight. Thank you, counselors. We'll begin our meeting with the prayer and pledge of allegiance led by Councillor Graves. Councillor Graves. Mr. President, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, Mr. President, if you will, I want to uh, invite Dr. Pastor Clyde Posley Jr. to uh, pray for us in this moment. Just a few words uh, about Dr. Posley. Uh, he is uh, the senior pastor of Antioch Baptist Church in the heart of Indianapolis, and he's been there for 21 years. Uh, Dr. Posley holds a Master's uh, of Arts degree in urban ministry. We will ask Councilor, Councilor Graves when he joins us at a later point in the-, in the Okay, are you, are you not able to hear me? in our meeting this evening, if we have the opportunity for prayer. But in the meantime, let us do the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance okay. to the flag. To the, flag. The, United the United States of America. States of America. America. To, the to the Republic. Republic. For which it stands. One nation. One nation. One nation. Under God. Under God. Under God. Indivisible. Indivisible. Liberty. 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 For all. Liberty. Justice. For all. Justice. For all. For all. Thank you, counselors. Madam Clerk, the clerk will now conduct a voice roll call. Counselors, please signify by stating your name and answering present following the clerk's reading of your name so that we have a clear record of who is in attendance. Madam Clerk, please proceed with the roll call. Thank you, Mr. President. Counselor Adamson. Counselor Adamson is here. Councillor Ane. Councillor Ane is present. Councillor Barth. Councillor Barth present. Councillor Boots. Councillor Boots present. Are you Councilor. ready for Pastor Posley to pray? Councillor Brown. Councillor Brown yeah. present. Councillor Carlino. Councillor Carlino present. Okay. Councillor Dilk. Councillor Dill, present. Councillor Ethan Evans. Councillor Ethan Evans, present. Councillor Weird Evans. Councillor Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for the privilege to come before this August body at such a pristine time as this. We come to you, God, realizing that we are in a moment in time where there are huddled masses who are yearning to be free who even themselves are affected by the effects of this pandemic must practice social distancing. We ask you in the name of Jesus as we come today that you would bless the proceedings, the proceedings that are before us today. And oh, how precious it is the work that this council does in our city. We come to you at a time, Father, realizing that you have created an atmosphere for us, or permitted one, where it does not so much matter 
whether one is Republican or Democrat. Political affiliations have become secondary to the glaring and obvious needs of the downtrodden left behind wounded sick or poor. I ask for a favor tonight over the decision, compassion, and commitments that this board will make on behalf of our city as they deliberate. Please, Father, bless their patience, their tolerance of one another, the neighbor which sits beside them, as well as the neighbor who will be most affected by the decisions that they make. I, along with these kingdom leaders, I boldly ask of you to bless all that is done. Bless President Osley and all of the party members of both constituencies to be and to do by choosing to be and to do what our city needs today. It is in Jesus' name that I pray. I close this prayer in expectation that your will will be done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Madam Clerk, will you continue with the roll call? Thank you, Mr. President. Yes. Councilor Jared Evans. Councilor Jared Evans here. Councilor Graves. Councilor Graves here. Councilor Gray. Councilor Gray. Councilor Hart. Councilor Hart here, present. Councilor Holliday. Present, Madam Clerk. Councilor Jackson. Jackson present. Councilor Johnson. Councilor Johnson present. Councilor Jones. Councilor Jones present. Councilor Lewis. Councilor Lewis present. Councilor Mascari. Councilor Mascari present. Councilor McCormick. Jessica McCormick present. Councilor Mowry. Councilor Mowry present. Councilor Oliver. Councilor Oliver. Councilor Osley. Present. Councilor Potts. Councilor Keith Potts, present. Councilor Ray. Madam Clerk, how many, how many councils are present this evening? Madam Clerk, how many councils are present this evening? 23. All right, seeing a quorum, we will proceed with official communications. Madam Clerk, will you begin with official, official communications? Madam Clerk, will you begin with official Ladies and gentlemen, you are hereby notified that regular meetings of the City County Council and Police, Fire, and Solid Waste Collection Special Service District Councils will be held in the City County Building in the Council Chambers on Monday, April 13th, 
2020 at 7 o'clock p.m. The purposes of such meetings being to conduct any and all business that may properly come before regular meetings of the councils. Sincerely, Bob Osley, President, City County Council. Ladies and gentlemen, pursuant to the laws of the state of Indiana, I cause to be published in the court and commercial record and in, in the Indianapolis Star on Friday, March 20th, 2020, a copy of a notice of public hearing on proposal number 89, 2020, said hearing to be held on Monday, April 13th, 2020 at seven o'clock PM in the public assembly room of the city county building. Respectfully, Sarita Hughes, clerk of the city county council. Ladies and gentlemen, pursuant to the laws of the state of Indiana, I cause to be published in the Indianapolis Star on Wednesday, April 8th, 2020, and in the court and commercial record on Friday, April 10th, 2020, a copy of a notice of public hearing on proposal numbers 136 and 137, 2020, said hearing to be held on Monday, April 13th, 2020, at seven o'clock p.m. in the public assembly room of the city county building. Respectfully, Sarita Hughes, Clerk of the City County Council. Ladies and gentlemen, I have approved of my signature and delivered this day to the Clerk of the City County Council, Sarita Hughes, the following ordinances. Fiscal ordinance right. numbers two and three, general ordinance numbers two and three, general resolution numbers one through three, and special resolution number 14. Joseph H. Hoxett, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. President. This concludes the official communications. Point of order, Mr. President. I can't I can't hear you. I didn't hear a word you just said. Mr. President, I'm here cannot hear you. Council Gray. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Councillor Gray, um, Councillor uh, President Osley is working on his sound. He's working on it now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Could you let me know when he's up and going? Madam um, Clerk, could you also maybe uh, get a message to Dr. Kane let her know that her uh, computer is not muted? All right, counselors, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right, my, my apologies. We had some audio um, audio issues. We will begin again. The next item on our agenda is introduction of guests to provide updates on the COVID-19 response here in Indianapolis. Those guests are Dr. Virginia Kane, who is the director of the Marion County Public Health Department. Ms. Ann Mertlow, who is president of the United Way of Central Indiana. And Michael Huber, president of the Indianapolis Chamber. I would ask for each to speak three to five minutes, and then I'm going to ask for counselors to, um, to pose any questions, and I'd like to keep that at about 10 minutes maximum. So if possible, I'd like to ask Dr. Kane uh, to provide us some updates, and we can keep that at maybe three to four minutes. I know you have amazing amounts of information, but you will be asked, I'm sure, a number of questions by our counselors. So Dr. Kane, please. 
So thank you, thank you very much. Um, just to give you an update, it is, seems like an echo. I don't know if I can correct this. Is my volume Mr. President, high? Mr. President, this is Councilor McCormick. Um, Dr. Kane has two sign-ins, so she has two different videos in right now, so that's probably why she's hearing the feedback. Can I, uh, can I delete one? Yes, please. How do I delete one? Okay, now can you hear me? Yeah, that's much better. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, so we currently have up to 3,012 cases with 123 deaths. Okay. Um, we are working very hard to be able to break that down. The demographic data for Marion County by the end of this week. We unfortunately had some hospital glitches with our data. But from a preliminary standpoint, we are looking at, um, it appears that 20% of these cases are in our white population in our early preliminary data looks like at least African Americans making up at least 40% of our case. And we predict it could go as high as 45%. With the majority of our cases in males at 70%, with 40% of our cases in female. But unfortunately, we're missing um, a significant number of cases that we've been able to identify by their demographics. So by the end of the week, we should be able to have a good data and more up to date with our cases. Um, I do want to quickly tell you, we've had three major initiatives, very concerned about our homeless population, where we are trying to make sure that we have set up multiple homeless shelters with no more than 100 in a shelter, because if we get some positive homeless patients, they can infect all of the homeless in a particular community. And so that's been very critical for our operations. We've also provided what we call strike teams. These are teams that are able to go into our correctional facilities and do testing for anyone that may be positive uh, with our inmate system and do the necessary testing related to that. We've also provided guidance to the judicial system to recommend early release of nonviolent offenders for home detention and GPS monitoring in order to reduce the number of inmates in our jails, because if confined, could lead to a major outbreak in our correctional uh, facility. As you know, we're working close in hand with our long-term care association, uh, providing guidance on nursing homes. We are we set up a our first drive-through uh, testing for city essential workers, which started ten days ago, um, and we continue to do contact investigations of coronavirus positive patients to determine exposure and who should go on a 14-day uh, quarantine. We're lastly setting up what's called a alternate point of care facility. This is like an overflow hospital type of setting 
where if our hospitals go overwhelmed, we have another location where we can have what we call uh, medical surge patients be able to be taken care of. And it will have a capacity up to about 200 patients uh, if any hospital setting needs more hospital beds. Based on our statistical modeling, we think that our peak of cases will occur the last week in April through the first two weeks of May, where we'll be at the height of our cases and hoping that we will not overwhelm our hospital care system. And I do, uh, um, um, President Bopp would like to have some recommendations to the city council after um, I answer questions related to the epidemic that I think is really critical to uh, curtaining this outbreak. Um, City Councilman Opsley, I cannot hear you. Do I need to, can everybody else hear uh, Mr. Ostley? So other council members do not appear to hear you, uh, President Ostley. All right, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. All right, perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Kane, for your presentation. Uh, fellow counselors, if uh, you have any questions, um, please raise your hand and I'll call upon you. All right, we'll start with Councilor Mowry. Councilor Mowry, if you can unmute. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Dr. Kane, I uh, yes, sir. sent an email last week or the week before last asking about the golf course closure. Uh, to my understanding, the donut counties do not have a similar closure. Um, I can understand shutting down golf courses for riding and you know being a golf cart, but when we are looking at uh, shutting down a golf course altogether, I think we're really hurting these folks that own these golf courses and uh, that maintenance of the golf course to make sure it's in pristine condition when they get back out there is still there for them. I mean, water costs alone to, you know, water a golf course, I can imagine is astronomical. Uh, what is the reason for one, I guess, I have not heard back from you. For two, and, why- And, and let you? me just say, I apologize for not getting back to you. Uh, the city of Indianapolis uh, kept receiving persistent calls related to people um, abusing the shelter in place privilege with a number of the golf courses so that um, they would have and see gatherings of 10 to 12 people, as many as that, at a golf hole, um, obviously not displaying any six feet difference. And uh, also having large gatherings inside the uh, facility where food was being served. And it was my understanding that uh, cautions were given to uh, uh, all of the golf courses uh, to please stay in compliance, but we continue to have persistence, uh, I guess you want to say folks who were non-compliant. Will I tell you that there were a significant number of golf courses who did an outstanding job following the rules, making sure that only one person was on a cart. Yes, that was the case, but they did have, uh, continue to have significant complaints with a small percentage of them. I have asked that we look and revisit that um, uh, at the end of the month to see whether we uh, should uh, relift that ban. Thank you. Thank you. S 
So, Ms. Toffoli, if you're speaking, I can't hear you again. Still can't hear you. Councillor Hart, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Now I can hear you. All right. So, Councillor Hart, you had a question, and then we'll follow up with uh, Councillor Jones. Yeah. So, my question is in reference to the. Uh, The care facilities, if you were doing or if we're considering the use of birth centers uh, for, you know, obviously, I'm sure infants are extremely high risk of this. Uh, I have any consideration gone into birth centers within Marion County to try and separate COVID patients from new mothers. So, yes, uh, there is recommendations that if you have pregnant mothers and they are at risk uh, for COVID. Uh, we have really tried to work on trying to separate them from other positive patients, what we call cohorting. So that if I have, let's just say they're confined in a correctional facility and they're pregnant or they have newborn babies, we uh, try at our 100 utmost ability to try to make sure they are removed and not in the same uh, vicinity as individuals who are positive. And we've tried to work very hard on that to date. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Um, Councillor Jones, did you have a question? All right, are there any additional questions from councillors? Councillor Boots. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. And Dr. Kane, I appreciate all the work you've been doing. And just had a quick question with respect to um, nursing homes and specifically memory care units. I've had a couple constituents call, uh, one whose parent passed away last week in such a memory care unit. And the concern she expressed was that, particularly in the memory care units, it's very difficult to maintain social distancing. And as you well know, um, they often hold hands and like like human touch. Is there anything specifically do, being done with nursing homes and any type of focus on that and particularly the memory care units? So what we're, so that's a great question and a very difficult and, and big challenge for us because as you say, some of them may be Alzheimer's patients, and, and like you say, they may hug or greet. So what we're trying to do, um, uh, we were only able to have testing available to our local health department just last week. So we're trying to go into those facilities that have identified anyone that's positive in a memory care setting to try to identify them, whether they have symptoms or not, in order to remove the positive patients from anybody that are negative in the rest of those memory care. So we just had that availability last week. We are starting to test in long-term care facilities. We have at least 56 in Marion County. So we're trying to concentrate on those facilities that have maybe uh, more than two or three COVID positive patients in that setting. But they are, because of their behavior, are at considerably high risk for contracting this. So we really want to identify anyone positive in those areas. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Any additional questions of Dr. Kane from counselors? Uh, Councillor Inay. Thank you, Mr. President. Dr. Kane, I just want to say, um, before I, I ask my question, I just want to extend appreciation on behalf of District 23. We're very appreciative for you and your team for all the hard work that you folks have put in. I'm just curious if you could give us a brief uh, rundown, just an idea of some of the folks that you work with um, at, at the state and federal level, just an idea of how we're all working together uh, to achieve uh, the best possible situation here in Indianapolis. Thank you. So, 
who we have worked on a federal le level. Uh, and I'll just start with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, Dr. Jay Butler, who is over the infectious disease section for the Centers for Disease Control. We've been on uh, frequent calls with him where the State Department of Health has been on those calls and myself asking technical questions and concerns related to some of the um, uh, considerable outbreaks or potential outbreaks that have been related to that. Uh, when we look at on a state level, uh, I'm in conversations with the Indiana State Health Commissioner, Christina Botts. I would say probably on the average about at least two or three times a day. Um, I have to knock uh, Dr. Box a little bit. Uh, she knows I like to watch Perry Mason from 11.30 at night to 12.30 in the morning. And she has called me at midnight uh, doing, that's my only relaxation that I have. Um, and uh, so I do knock her sometimes for calling me and she's called me at 4.51 in the morning. So we're, we, we have constant communication with Dr. Box as well as her deputy health commissioner, Pam Patanis, on a frequent basis. I will probably say that with the Division of Family Social Services, Dr. Jen Sullivan, I probably talk to her probably on the average of at least about twice a week. So we really try to do our coordination um, well, trying to work out any bugs is so that we're not duplicating and just uh, trying to coordinate our efforts on a, a national level. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Kane. Uh, when this is all said and done uh, and we, uh, we get to where we wanna be back to normal, I wish you many uh, days off watching Perry Mason. You've earned it, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kane. We have a question uh, from Councilor Oliver. Yes, Councilor Oliver. I can hear you barely. You can talk a little louder. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, you are one of my biggest fans. Sir, maybe your biggest fan. I think between Dr. Fitch, Governor Como, and Dr. Jimmy Payne. In that all. Thank you, sir. I got two questions of interest. Uh, one is the uh, the untried uh, virus on server that been brought to the city of Detroit, but it'll be used there. Is there any uh, thought of suggestion that bring that to get it out? If so, what is your opinion on it? I couldn't quite hear the question. I don't know if you could repeat it. Um, President Bob. Um, yes, uh, Councilor Oliver was asking about a serum, some serum that has been introduced uh, as a test in Detroit and whether or not you, one, are aware of it and two, would you have any, any interest in bringing that, um, that sort of experimental work here to Indianapolis? So if I'm not mistaken, that may be the clinical trial that is looking at antibodies. These are patients that have had a COVID-19 infection and their body has developed a, a normal immune, immune response to the infection. And they may be hoping that these antibodies, which are proteins in your body, that your body produces whenever it has an infection, hoping to use antibodies from uh, various patients to see if it provides partial immunity to patients uh, in our communities to see if it makes a difference, whether they're getting infected at the same rate as someone who does not have that. So if that's the same study that you're alluding to, uh, we are looking at that study with interest. 
Thank you, Dr. Kane. Um, I see there was a question from uh, Councillor Ethan Evans. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you um, for all the work you've done, uh, Dr. Kane. Um, and I wanted to reference um, something Councillor N.A. brought up um, with your work uh, with the state level and uh, with Dr. Box. I've heard about um, the governor's uh, address earlier today, and he was asked a question about um, the prisoner release as well at the state level. And I just wanted to know if there had been any talks with Dr. Box and at the state level about expanding what we've been doing at the county level to the state level about low level, you know, prisoner release and, you know, expanding the strike teams into the state level, you know, penitentiaries and IDOC so that, you know, it can help stop the spread and, you know, flatten the curve at the state level so that it doesn't expand outside Marion County so that we don't have a repeat, you know, come, you know, in the next few months, you know, when people are trapped in, you know, small areas. So, so that's a huge concern for us um, that uh, what we find sometimes is, is that as people who may be released uh, from state prisons, but they may not necessarily be a, a resident of Marion County, but that our resources may be easier for someone to be released to a homeless shelter that we may get a disproportionate share of those folks released from state correctional facilities. This is a discussion that we have had with the state. So we're trying to look at that very carefully um, to make sure that the resources are, are here. But more important, we'd like for those resources to be available in those counties where these prisoners reside from. So that's a major discussion we are having on a state and local level related to that to that uh, key uh, 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 issue that you are addressing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Kane, I want to say thank you so much for your presentation this evening. And I also want to say thank you for the data that you provided on the disparities by race of those who have fallen uh, victim to uh, the COVID-19. Obviously, this is of grave concern. Um, and I, I, I look forward to, uh, to working alongside of you to seeing what we can do, um, one, to address it, and two, to mitigate this um, at its root. But thank you very much for your presentation this evening. So, uh, Council, obviously, I have a major issue that I do want to bring before the Council for your consideration. Please. You, you know that as our city confronts a, a public health crisis, I think it's vital that we continue to together to save lives and slow the spread of this COVID-19. One important way that we can do that is by encouraging residents to vote by mail rather than try to vote in person on election day. So I want you to know I fully support providing every voter with an absentee ballot application as a public health strategy for a safer election. Because I think we will continue to have significant coronavirus in our communities June the 2nd. Secondly, I would also like to bring up that as we start to we start to integrate um, our cities back to um, their operations prior to this coronavirus, we may still need to make some recommendations such as we may not be able to hold large convention settings still in our community as other states and other cities may be having a later explosion of their cases. And so we'd like to talk with or work with some city council members about how we can 
in terms of our recovery, gradually put things in place in operation, but we may never be able to go back to where we were completely back to um, uh, prior to the coronavirus. So as we're gonna look real closely at the golf courses, whether we can reopen that, there may be some other things that we feel we may be able to reopen. And so what should those things be first? Uh, because you just can't open everything completely all at once. So I'd like to work with some members of the city council to work on those strategies. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure that you will have a number of volunteers. Um, we'll get with uh, our council members um, and to see uh, who we could uh, move forward to work alongside of you. Thank you so much. And I just want to thank please. again uh, for the strong support we've had for our city council members. A lot of you have done a great job in doing uh, education to your uh, constituent members, and we appreciate that greatly, and we'll continue to provide you the information you need in order to address um, our epidemic in Marion County. So on behalf of our chairman of the board, uh, Joyce Rogers from Health and Hospital Corporation, uh, we extend you um, our uh, support for any of your initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Thank you for your work. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. All right. All right, counselors. Um, next, we would like to hear from Ann Mertlo, who is uh, president of the United Way of Central Indiana, Ms. Ms. Mertlo. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Good evening, President Ossoli and counselors. Thank you for having me back tonight to brief you on our activities since I was last here on March 16th. Just 10 days before I spoke to you last, on March 6th, Indiana recorded its first case of COVID-19. Just a week later, on March 13th, United Way, in conjunction with five other funders, Lilly Endowment, CICF, Eli Lilly and Company Foundation, Richard M. Fairbanks Foundation, and the Nina Mason Pulliam Charitable Trust, announced the establishment of the Central Indiana COVID-19 Community Economic Recovery Fund, or CSERF. The fund was launched with $17 million in commitments from the founding funders and has since grown to over $22 million with the support from foundations, corporations, and individuals in our community. The purpose of the fund is to support human services organizations making up the human services safety net and provide individuals with basic needs and information and referral services. Our goal is basically to meet the rapidly growing demand for services caused by the economic effects of the coronavirus crisis. This has been a particularly challenging time for these organizations um, during this crisis for several reasons. Revenue losses from canceled programs, lost donations, and postponed fundraising events has been severe. Sources of volunteers that those organizations count on to deliver services have all but dried up, in large part because corporations are no longer supporting volunteer programs that provide most of those volunteers. And traditional walk-in service models that most of those organizations provide have had to be completely redesigned to provide outreach services and virtual services. The type of plan that United Way is taking um, to deal with all of this is basically a five point plan. The first point is to work with stakeholders and those would include the city, including Deputy Mayor Jeff Bennett and Dr. Virginia Kane, state officials, including um, Secretary uh, Dr. Jen Sullivan F at, at FSSA and her counterpart at DCS, um, those on the front line at hundreds of human service agencies and uh, all of the funders that we just mentioned. 
And we're working with all of those folks to identify the most critical emergent needs as they arise during this crisis. And as you know, they just change um, day to day, week to week. The second is to resource the human services sector to address those most critical and emergent needs while practicing responsible social distancing. So understanding that we have to resource those, but we have to do that in a way that allows those organizations to actually provide services while making sure that we don't make the health crisis worse. The third is to coordinate funding to ensure that what, what the, the limited philanthropic resources we have will supplement relief dollars provided by the government and avoid to the greatest extent possible duplicative efforts. Recognizing that the, the amount of money that will be coming from the government will be very significant, but sometimes takes a while to get here. Um, I'm going to talk about those three first, and then I'll come back to the last two. So to date, the focus has been on these first three points. We've made two distributions, uh, large distributions of funds from CSERF, totaling nearly $12 million to 74 human services organizations, focusing on the following critical areas of need. Food access, safe sheltering for homeless, domestic violence victims, and children whose parents or guardians have been hospitalized and who have nowhere else to go. So essentially they are put into the child welfare system because hospitals have nowhere to send them. Child care for first responders and healthcare workers, disaster planning like blood collection and infrastructure support, so particularly 211 services that provide information and referral services that include not only um, connection with nonprofit, but also connection to government services like um, how to sign up for unemployment. Disaster planning, oh, I'm sorry, uh, essential in-home care for the elderly and disabled. Um, so in-home care now for folks who just cannot do without these in-home services. Um, and these are caregivers who really have to provide services and cannot do it while social distancing. But these are people who um, absolutely cannot survive without this care. Mental health services. Support for multi multi service neighborhood centers, so our community centers um, and services for underserved or isolated communities, including LGBTQ refugees, immigrants and communities of color. In addition, United Way has focused on educating the human services sector on the significant benefits available to nonprofit organizations under the provisions of the CARES Act, such as the ability to um, access um, forgivable SBA loans. Um, and we've done that by providing webinars and resources immediately following the passage of the act so that our nonprofits in central Indiana would be prepared to act very quickly to take advantage of these critical supports. And then finally, um, as, as others such as the medical community and CICP, and this, this, goes, um, this goes to our fourth and fifth points, um, as others like the, the chambers and CICP are looking for ways to safely get us back to work, um, we are looking forward to the human services supports necessary to support getting people back to work. Um, because with schools closed, and with daycares closed, summer programming for children um, is unclear. And that leaves childcare options and thus return to work options less than certain for many families. That creates great uncertainty for employers who are relying on the return of their workforce to drive productivity necessary to restart the economy. And without that supporting infrastructure, we will struggle to quickly regain equilibrium, even with the easing of the health crisis. So what I mean by that is, as we start to think, as we all would like to, although Dr. Kane's recommendations to you were a bit sobering, I have to say, um, as we like to think about getting people back to work, 
if we're not also thinking about how to get child cares and these summer programs back up so that people have a place to take their children, we will find that we don't have the workforces ready to get our businesses back up and going. And so United Way is always thinking not just about disaster recovery, like we have during our healthcare crisis, but also about the long-term recovery, which starts with things like long-term childcare options, but also about the long-term family recovery, which includes things like financial stability and reemployment um, of people in our community. So we are mindful that the actions that we take now will play a role in how quickly we are able to reach that desired outcome in the future. Um, and that's why we made an investment from our Family Opportunity Fund to the Indianapolis E-Learning Fund that was announced um, last week by the mayor, um, in large part because we know that household technology and connectivity will be a key to the success of all generations in our households when this crisis is over. Um, we are here not just for the short term, but for the long term, and we'll continue to serve uh, with our focus on basic needs, family opportunity, and social innovation, both now and the, in the future. Um, we deeply appreciate our partnership with the, fit, the city in all forms of its government um, as we collectively serve its citizenry um, in its time of need. So thank you very much for the opportunity to brief you again and for your partnership and leadership. Um, at this time. Thank you so much. And thank you for spending the time with us this uh, this evening. Uh, fellow counselors, do we have questions for Ms. Mertlo? Counselor Boots. I believe you are you are muted. There we go. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I really appreciate the United Way as well and, and what you're doing, particularly working with uh, the other community partners on this fund. Is, is there a way, uh, Ms. Mertlow, that we can get a uh, maybe a weekly status, uh, a single page infographic, whatever is convenient for your organization with these ongoing stats? That, that's something I do with a weekly update with my district. And, and one thing I am covering is what United Way is doing with the CICF and what have you. So is there a possibility you could start supplying that information. The, the best way to get that is we're not doing um, regular funding rounds, so we're doing them as quickly as we can. But the, the information is contained in our press releases. So we have two of those that have come out so far, and they list all of the organizations we have funded and the areas that we've focused on. I'm happy to send those both to you. Um, and um, and we can make sure that we we put all of the counselors on our distribution list as as a regular um, regular distribution point. That would be wonderful. Also, Thank you. And it can also be found on our website if you ever need them. That's just uwci.org if you ever need to find them quickly. Thank you. Excellent. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you. Do we have any additional questions for Ms. Mertlow? All right, very good. Um, and thank you for, for spending the time with us this evening. We're very grateful. Thank you for the work that you're doing and the collaborations that you're making. My pleasure. Thank you for your support. Bless you. All right. Um, and then I would like to ask if Mike Huber is still uh, still with us, if he, Mike Huber, president of um, the Indianapolis Chamber. Yes. If he could provide us a presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. Um, again, I just appreciate your leadership in this incredibly uncertain time. Uh, I noticed that all of you continue to serve, serve your constituents and uh, hold public meetings, even if it's in non-traditional ways. So uh, thank you for your leadership at this time. Um, a month ago, uh, President Osley asked uh, several of us, including Dr. Kane, including Ann Merlo and myself, and um, it, that it feels like a year ago to me, I'm sure it feels like a year ago to all of you. Um, uh, as I recall on that day that you met a month ago, the chamber had just put up um, what we call the rapid response hub, which can still be found at response.indychamber.com. And at that time, the purpose of the hub was to bring together uh, all, of these inf all of this information, primarily for small business, but for anybody, that whether they were directives from Dr. Kane or 
uh, Mayor Hogsett or the governor or the federal government, we could put that in one place because that was a time when it felt like the information was changing on an hour to hour basis. And I know that's been the case for much of the last month. Um, our hub received thousands of requests from citizens, um, many of them business owners, just to, just questions initially like, can I stay open? Should I stay open? Um, what if I have uh, employees that I'm going to need to take to part-time status? What are resources available? We started to see a shift um, later that week, and really by the week of March 21st, it was obvious that um, we would need, somebody would need to, to identify loans to at least these businesses because there was a lot of confusion uh, among businesses about could they stay open. Many of the, uh, many of the restaurants had closed their doors. Uh, some were considering whether or not they were going to come back. So we monitored what was happening with the federal government. And on, if memory serves me, uh, March the 25th, the federal government passed the CARES Act um, the largest uh, relief bill of its type, I think, in American history. And it included aid to small businesses, um, particularly via the federal SBA, Small Business Administration. And even though the federal government had passed that significant aid package, in our conversations with Mayor Joe Hogsett, we still felt that some kind of a local loan product would be really, really important for small businesses. And we were really targeting very small businesses and the, that, that would request amounts of at the, at the highest $25,000, but it goes down to at that $1,000. So on March 28th, uh, Mayor Joe Hogsett and the Indy Chamber announced the creation of the Rapid Response Loan Fund. It was, uh, it was seeded with um, One million dollars loaned to it by the CIB, uh, a grant of a half a million dollars from the bond bank, and we committed to go raise at least 8.5 million more to in in the effort to try to create a 10 million dollar uh, local loan fund that was 85 percent funded by the private sector, and this loan fund was in addition to significant federal money that is coming through. Um, the banks, in some cases, uh, tax credits. I'll, I'll say a little more about the loan fund and then just have uh, a couple more things and then I'll, I'll take your questions or comments. Um, uh, we have raised uh, nearly $6 million so far. So the private sector has stepped up to uh, contribute about four and a half million. Um, the most recent contribution was a uh, $1 million grant from the Bruce White Family Foundation. Anthem also contributed a million dollars. We've had several banks contribute six figures, and we've got additional funders that were they've given us a verbal, uh, but we hope to once we get it in writing make public announcement of more. I do believe that in the next few weeks we will exceed ten million dollars. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the the requests that we have received as of um, this morning. So this is. The loan program had been in existence for two weeks. And again, this is the rapid response loan program created by the Indy Chamber um, with a significant investment from the city of Indianapolis. And this is two weeks ago. Our organization had, had received 830 total requests as of this morning. Uh, not all of those requests will turn into loan applications because uh, they're, they're talking with a live person about you know, maybe problems or challenges their business is having. Um, and some, sometimes one of our folks may direct them to one of the federal sources as a, as a primary source, but, we, but of course our um, newly created loan program is available. So 830 total requests, 392 applications, and then over 100 of those applications are far enough along in the, in the uh, underwriting process and approval process. And last week we closed 22 loans. Um, in excess of uh, $388,000 in funds. We expect to do a lot more than that by the close of this week based on the demand. The industries that are um, inquiring about this loan fund, it's about 16% food and beverage, about 14% real estate and construction, 9% is other retail, so not restaurants, 9% uh, personal services and care, uh, seven and a half percent business and professional services, and then uh, an assortment of others. But it's no question the restaurants have been hit very hard. Now, 
Um, I will say the federal aid that is coming is significant and it will make a difference, but, um, you know, anytime there's a new program, there's kind of a scramble because we're talking about small business owners. Uh, many of these are businesses that don't necessarily have, you know, an HR director or an accountant that's got the time to um, get to, to research these new federal programs. But I do want to mention there's the Paycheck Protection Program that many of you are familiar with that Ann Mertlow mentioned or the, the PPP, um, which to which uh, businesses can apply directly through their banks. There are the EIDL or economic injury disaster loans that businesses can apply to SBA at sba.gov directly. And then there are various tax credits that we encourage businesses to speak to their accounts. So when we interact with these businesses, our first advice is, are you talking to your banker? Are you talking to your accountant? Because the, oftentimes the best thing that we can do is steer them toward the federal like patient protection program, which th that money will be converted into forgivable loans. The loan program that we have, uh, real, that we produce, that we released, those loans are at about 3.75%. But we're seeing an overwhelming amount of demand. And for instance, if, if all of the requests that we received turned into actual loan applications, they won't, but this is kind of how we, how we measure ourselves, there would be almost $16 million in total funding requested. So we are going to have our work cut out for us in trying to raise that full 10 million. And, and, and we believe that the number should be a little bit higher. So we, I want to thank you for your support because this local loan product is a really important complement to the federal dollars. And in some cases, businesses that are eligible for the federal programs that I mentioned are going to need four or six or eight weeks of working capital just to keep their businesses afloat. We are trying to keep as many small businesses alive as we possibly can and give the business owners hope um, uh, during this incredibly uncertain time. And through your support, I believe we are going to be able to do that through hundreds of businesses that will receive you know, loans between $25,000 and, and $1,000 as a complement to what the banks are doing, as a complement to the federal dollars. Um, the last thing that I'll say before I take your, your questions or comments is um, this is aimed at small business. Um, the city's dollars that Mayor Hogsett contributed uh, must be used in Marion County. The CIB's loan must be directed toward food and beverage businesses, which also happens to be our most um, common uh, industry that's requesting information. But additional private sector dollars do make this a regional program. So 70, 76% of the inquiries this morning were from Marion County, but with certain stipulations, we also do offer it to businesses in the uh, nine county region. Um, we, we continue to receive a lot of questions from businesses about employees. How can I protect the interests of my employees? What if I need to take my employees to part-time? Um, uh, what if I need to find part-time unemployment, uh, part-time employment opportunities for my employees? How can I make them eligible for unemployment insurance? We're working with other partners, including Employee Indy, including United Way, to make sure that um, we, we're, we're helping businesses with the full range of options. But 80% of our efforts right now have been directed at this loan program, and the uh, response has been overwhelming. So we thank you for your support, and we're happy to continue to provide updates as long as all of us are dealing with the challenges of this coronavirus crisis. Uh, Mr. President, at this time, um, I'm happy to take uh, your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Huber. Uh, fellow counselors, I see um, uh, Councillor uh, Robinson, you had a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kane, for your for your commentary. And uh, uh, Anne, uh, Anne, thank you as well from uh, Wade. Thank you, Mike, for your work as well. A couple questions. When we get an accounting for um, the funds and how they're being dispersed, uh, primarily for the uh, minority businesses that are participating and receiving loans, and not just the minority, though, the breakdown of African American owned businesses and the amounts that they're receiving as well. So, uh, 22, I'd like to have it for the 22 first. Then, also, just as we go through the process, uh, I'd like to see a breakdown of the loan amounts, who's receiving them, the diversity, and also the location of those businesses in our city. Absolutely. Uh, yes, we would be happy to provide that and just a, um, a high-level estimate. Uh, we would estimate that um, uh, over uh, 
let's see, uh, as this is just a high level estimate, but um, uh, over 25% of our um, inquiries have been through minority owned businesses as then the program's two weeks old, but we would be happy to provide uh, a breakdown to the council on a regular basis of the allocation of those dollars and break it down in, in as segmented a manner as we can. One, one more, Mr. President. Please. So, and also, uh, Mike, how are you advertising, promoting, uh, like with the Indianapolis Recorder, um, Radio One, uh, through Black Expo, through the Urban League? Because again, uh, I do know the Indy Chamber's reach, but are you specifically advertising uh, these loans to those different demographics who may not be aware of what you're doing? Yeah, so um, it's early uh, tomorrow. So I'm on the I'm serve on the board of the Indianapolis Urban League and just submitted a request before I got on this call. Um, uh, if they'll have me tomorrow to be on Radio One between one and three p.m. Um, we had uh, uh, I'll have I'll have to check. We've reached out to the recorder through a couple of my uh, colleagues, but uh, I want to confirm getting the word out is very important. And uh, the program is about two weeks old, and yet. We know we're hitting massive demand, so I would be happy to follow up uh, through the council in terms of how we're how we're uh, leveraging all media uh, to get the word out about the program, Councillor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Additional questions, uh, Councillor uh, Ethan Evans. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, thank you, Mike, um, for what you've been doing at the Indy Chamber and for this program. Um, I had um, been reached out to by a couple people with small businesses, and um, they had concerns about um, the repayment of them and the interest. And you know, when I looked online, it said the interest on it was around three and a half percent for paying it back. And I was just curious about you know the timeline. For repayment because you know of the situation that they're all currently in right now about when they would get to reopen and start having the money flow coming in for revenue you know what would be the requirements for repayment for that interest you know, to kick in or would there be like a deferment um in this instance so, so yeah, about that. I appreciate Councillor Evans. So the um, we believe we offer very flexible repayment terms with a long timeline. It depends on the on the loan. It uh, but, you know if they're at the twenty five thousand mark, which is the ceiling of this particular program, or if it was a, a much smaller loan. In both cases, I would actually encourage the person to call us because um, one of the things that's important for us to do is to see if they are working with their bank and if they're eligible for one of the federal programs I mentioned, because if they're eligible for PPP, that money would be forgivable. And we want to encourage them to exhaust all their possibilities to be eligible for that. And then if they need the rapid response loan program as a bridge loan or a gap filler, then that would be a secondary or third priority, if, if that makes sense. So in some, in, we would want them to make sure that they're exhausting uh, all possibilities with the federal money, which is the most flexible, and then we would look at their eligibility for for our program. So I I, I know that doesn't answer the specific um, uh, questions that your constituents raised, but that would be that's a perfect opportunity uh, for us to have a dialogue with them and see what would make the most sense for their business. Very good. Additional question uh, for uh, for Mr. Huber. All right, seeing none. Um, Mike, thank you very much for, for, for taking the time this evening and for the work that you're doing to keep our businesses afloat. Uh, you've, you've done a tremendous job and given a lot of, of solace and, and comfort and encouragement to, um, to our local businesses. Thank you. Well, thank you, Councillor and uh, Pre Mr. President. Thank you, the members of the Council. And we will follow back with the reporting that was requested from members of the Council tonight. That's excellent. All right. Well, you all have a good evening. So, uh, Dr. Kane and um, uh, Anne Mertlow and, and Mike Huber, once again, thank you for, for spending time with us this evening. Thank you. All right. Um, counselors, we will uh, start, um, we will get started now on our official business. And I will ask our clerk um, 
The next item on our agenda being official communications. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. President. Proposal number 124, introduced by Councilor Osley, referred to the Metropolitan and Economic Development Committee, approves the statement of benefits of Union at 16th LP, the Annex Group, an applicant for tax abatement for property located in an economic revitalization area. Proposal um. number. Just a second, um, a matter of fact, we may have jumped over a couple of things. Okay. Don't mind. Okay. Let's uh, let's go back to official communications. If if you uh, if you could, would you um, would you go through that with me? Um, and then we also have to do some adoption of uh, of our agenda for this evening. Okay, we did do the official communications, but I can read them again if you like. Well, no, actually, you're right. Our adoption of the agenda, um, counselors. Um, do I have consent? Consent. Consent. All right, very good. The next item on our agenda is um, is approval of our journals for, for March the 16th, 2020 and April the 6th, 2020. Do I have consent? Consent. 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 All right. <laughs> um, there is no business under um, special orders and presentation of petitions, memorials, special resolutions, and council re resolutions. So. Uh, Madam Clerk, um, please now begin. Thank you, Mr. President. Proposal number 124, introduced by Councilor Osley, referred to the Metropolitan and Economic Development Committee, approves the statement of benefits of union at 16th LP, the Annex Group, an applicant for tax abatement for property located in an economic revitalization area. Proposal numbers 125 through 129 and 131 through 135, referred to the Public Works Committee. Proposal number 125, introduced by Mr. Osley, authorizes parking restrictions on Pennsylvania Street from 16th to 25th Streets in District 11. Proposal number 126, introduced by Councilor Holliday, authorizes a speed limit reduction to 25 miles per hour in the Times and Meadows subdivision in District 20. Proposal number 127, introduced by Councillor Jared Evans, authorizes a speed limit reduction to 25 miles per hour in the Spring Valley subdivision in District 22. Proposal number 128, introduced by Councillor Mowry, authorizes a speed limit reduction to 25 miles per hour in the Stonebriar subdivision in District 25. Proposal number 129, authorize, I mean, introduce. Councillor Adamson authorizes a speed limit reduction to 25 miles per hour in the Brookwood subdivision in District 17. Proposal number 131, introduced by Councillor Jones, authorizes intersection controls at Kennington and Iowa Streets in District 16. Proposal number 132, introduced by Councillor Jackson, authorizes a speed limit reduction to 25 miles per hour in the Cherry Lake subdivision in District 14. Proposal number 133, introduced by Councilor Arne, authorizes a speed limit reduction to 25 miles per hour in the Orchard Valley and Rockwood subdivisions in District 23. Proposal number 134, introduced by Councilor Arne, introduced excuse me, authorizes intersection controls at Capitol Avenue and Midland Road in District 23. Proposal number 135, introduced by Councilor Gray, authorizes intersection controls at 52nd Street and Alameda Road in District 8. Proposals number 136 and 137 were referred to the Committee of the Whole and were introduced by Councilor Osley. Proposal number 136, approves the, an additional appropriation in the 2020 budget of the Office of Public Health and Safety Consolidated County General Fund in characters two, three, and four to be used in response to the coronavirus. Proposal number 137, approves an addi additional appropriation totaling $2,089,455 in the 2020 budget of the Marion County Election Board 
County General and Cumulative Capital Funds for the mailing of absentee applications, so of additional express vote machines, and for the necessary equipment to run the Marion County elections of 2020. Proposal number 142, introduced by Councilors Ethan Evans, Brown, Barth, Graves, and Osley, referred to the Public Works Committee, offers the bus only and bus and turn lanes for the purple line and amends the code to make various changes to chapters 441 and 621 regarding traffic and parking as part of the Purple Lane Rapid Transit Project, one key component of the Marion County Transit Plan. Mr. President, this concludes the introduction. Thank you, Madam Clerk. <clears throat> the next item on our agenda is Special Orders Priority Business. Proposal number 138 is a rezoning ordinance certified for approval by the Metropolitan Development Commission on April the 2nd. If no counselor wishes to call down the proposal for reconsideration, the proposal will pass into law. Does anyone wish to call down the proposal for reconsideration? All right, seeing no one, the proposal will pass into law. Proposal numbers 139 through 141 are rezoning ordinances certified for approval by the Metropolitan Development Commission on April the 2nd, 2020. If no counselor wishes to call down the proposals for reconsideration, the proposals will pass into law. Does anyone wish to call down any of the proposals for reconsideration? All right, seeing none, the proposal will pass into law. The next item on our agenda is special orders, public hearing. Proposal number 80 is a rezoning ordinance for Wayne Township in Council District 15, located at 8150 Rockville Road. Zoning case 2019 CZN 840 was recommended for approval by the Metropolitan Development Commission on February the 12th, 2020. District Councilor McCormick called the matter down for a public hearing. The proposal was continued on March the 16th, 2020 as negotiations continued. Both petitioners and remonstrators agreed to forego the preliminary hearing on the matter due to a resolution being reached and new commitments being filed. So let's go to Councillor McCormick for a motion. Councillor McCormick. Hi, Mr. President. I am pleased to report that there are no issues to resolve for the at 8150 Rockville Road. As an agreement has been reached between the petitioner and the remonstrator, and additional commitments have been filed, <clears throat> and it will not be necessary to have a hearing on this matter. Therefore, I move that the public hearing be foregone and that proposal number 80 2020 rezoning petition number 2019 CCN 840 be adopted with the newly filed commitments. Second. Very good. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Thank you very much, councilors. Section 15179 of our council rules are very specific regarding zoning matters that are called down for a public hearing. So both remonstrators and petitioner are given 20 minutes each to present arguments in addition to comments and questions by counselors and anyone else from the public wishing to speak. And even though the remonstrators of record on proposal number 80-2020, zoning case 2019 CZN 840, have accepted commitments and agreed to forego the formal presentations and a public hearing on this matter and accept the rezoning with the new commitments made by the petitioner, the proposal was advertised for public hearing at this meeting. Madam Clerk, have we received any public comment online regarding this proposal? No, we have not received any public comment. All right, thank you. And I think my room is, is practically empty, but I will ask if there's anyone in the public in attendance who would like to speak to proposal number 80-2020. All right. I see no one. Um, are there any additional comments from counselors? All right, seeing none. The petition has been duly made and seconded to adopt the rezoning as certified with newly filed commitments. We'll now take a vote on proposal 80. 
Madam Clerk, are we going to go through this um, this roll call? Yes. Councillor Adamson. Councillor Adamson, I vote yes. Councillor Arne. Councillor Arne, I vote yes. Councillor Barth. Councillor Barth, yes. Councillor Boots. Sorry. Councillor Boots. Councillor Boots, aye. Councillor Brown. Councillor Brown, yes. Councillor Carlino. Councillor Carlino, aye. Councillor Dilk. Councillor Dilk, yes. Councillor Ethan Evans. Councillor Ethan Evans, yes. Councillor Jared Evans. Councillor Jared Evans, yes. Councillor Graves. Councillor Graves, yes. Councillor Gray. Councillor Gray. Councillor Hart. Councillor Hart, yes. Councillor Holiday. Holiday, yes. Councillor Jackson. Councillor Jackson, aye. Councilor Johnson. Councilor Johnson, aye. Councilor Jones. Councilor Jones, aye. Councilor Lewis. Councilor Lewis, aye. Councilor Mascari. Councilor Mascari, aye. Councilor McCormick. Aye. Councilor McCormick, aye. Councilor Mowry. Councilor Mowry, aye. Councilor Oliver. Councillor Oliver, aye. Councillor Osley. Councillor Osley, aye. Councillor Potts. Councillor Potts, aye. Councillor Ray. Councillor Ray. Councillor Robinson. Councillor Robinson, aye. Thank you, Mr. President. We have 24 yay and one not voting. All right, the motion carries. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Madam Clerk. The next item is proposal 89, referred to Public Works Committee, Chairman Adamson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Pull up my notes here. Proposal number 89 approves an additional appropriation totaling $9,600,000 in the 2020 budget of the Department of Public Works, Transportation General, and Solid Waste Collection for personnel and contractual costs for the Engineering Division and to fund additional personnel costs associated with the continued implementation of a second shift for capital equipment for the Operations Division, Transportation General Fund Appropriations supported from an additional anticipated state distribution of gas tax revenues and to fund the leasing of new capital equipment for the solid waste division, solid waste collection general fund. Councilor Jones moved and seconded by Councilor McCormick to amend proposal number 89 that essentially reduces the appropriation from 9,600,000 down to 3,600,000 in the Department of Public Works, Transportation General, solid waste general collection fund. The uh, motion to amend proposal number 89 passed by a vote of 11 to 0. Councillor McCormick moved, seconded by Councillor Oliver, to send proposal number 89 to the full council to do pass recommendation, and that motion carried by a vote of 11 to 0, and I so move. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you, councillors. Are there comments from councillors on proposal number 89? Right, seeing none. Is there has anyone written in on any questions, Madam Clerk, on proposal number eighty-nine? No, we do not have any questions. Thank you very much. Seeing no, uh, seeing no one in the audience, um, councilors, um, are there any additional comments? Very good. And seeing none, we will proceed to our vote, Madam Clerk. Councillor Adamson. Councillor Adamson, aye. Councillor Arne. 
Councillor Ane, aye. Councillor Barth. Councillor Barth, aye. Councillor Boots. Councillor Boots, aye. Councillor Brown. Councillor Brown, aye. Councillor Carlino. Councillor Carlino, aye. Councillor Dilk. Councillor Dilk, aye. Councillor Ethan Evans. Councillor Ethan Evans, aye. Councillor Jared Evans. Councillor Jared Evans, aye. Councillor Graves. Councillor Graves, yes. Councillor Gray. Councillor Gray. Councillor Hart. Michael Hart, aye. Councillor Holiday. Councillor Holiday, aye. Councillor Jackson. Councillor Jackson, aye. Councillor Johnson. Councillor Johnson, aye. Councillor Jones. Councillor Jones, aye. Councillor Lewis. Councillor Lewis, aye. Councillor Mascari. Councillor Mascari, aye. Councillor McCormick. Hello, Councillor McCormick, aye. Councillor Mallory. Councillor Mallory, aye. Councillor Oliver. Councillor Oliver, aye. Councillor Osley. Councillor Osley, aye. Councillor Potts. Councillor Potts, aye. Councillor Ray. Councillor Robinson. Councillor Robinson, aye. Mr. President, there are 24 yeas and zero and one not non voting. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. That motion carries. Uh, the next item on our agenda is proposal number 136. I believe everyone has a copy of the proposal which approves an additional appropriation in the 2020 budget of the Office of Public Health and Safety, Consolidated County General Fund in characters two, three, and four to be used in response to the coronavirus. Um, I believe that our CFO, uh, Scott Hole, might have some comments on this. Um, Mr. CFO, are you available? All right, then we will we will proceed. Um, is there a motion um, to adopt proposal number one thirty six? So moved. Second. Second. All, right. All right, it's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, are there comments from councilors on proposal number one thirty six? All right, seeing none. Um, Madam Clerk. Has there been uh, anyone with written in questions on proposal number 136? No, no questions or comments. All right, very good. Additional comments from councilors? Um, Councilor Ethan Evans. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So I just had a clarifying question. So this proposal is written in a way that it is limited in scope to just this particular event um, and situation, uh, if I'm correct. Um, so it said to be used in response to the coronavirus. Um, so meaning that after a period of time, it will expire in and of itself, or will we have to come back and write a proposal to uh, cancel it out? All right, I'm going to I'm going to move that question to uh, our CFO, uh, Mr. Hole. Mr. Hole, are you available now? Yes, I am. 
I'm actually replying under TKs. For some reason, my audio isn't working. Um, but the, the short answer is that, yes, these funds are dedicated to uh, just the response to the current coronavirus out, uh, epidemic, and unspent funds would return to fund balance uh, at the end of this event. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Was there a second question? Councillor Booth. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Um, it, just for purposes of educating the council, myself included, as well as those members of the public, uh, could our CFO please go through and just uh, describe generally the, the different buckets of the characterization of these fees and expenses and what that means from practical terms? Correct. Yes. So, um, Fifty thousand dollars are to be put into character two. Character two would be um, basically supplies. Specifically, they're going to be looking um, purchasing personal protection equipment such as masks, gloves, gowns, um, hand sanitizer, items such as that. There's four hundred thousand dollars being uh, appropriated to character three. That would be um, contracts and services. Specifically, what we're looking at here is the lease of a, a chilled warehouse um, in addition to um, uh, refrigerated trailer units. They're being utilized by the Marion County Corner at this time to handle overflow of deceased, um, deceased individuals. And then $300,000 in character four, which is for uh, UV sanitation devices that have presently been requested by the Marion County Sheriff for use in the jail uh, and their facilities, but it's, um, it's believed that additional agencies, departments will be requesting those devices as well. Thank you. All right. Additional questions from counselors? Very good. Um, seeing none then, uh, Madam Clerk, I wanted to confirm, we we have no written in questions that refer or speak to proposal number 136, is that correct? That is correct. All right, if there are no additional comments, then we will proceed to our vote. Madam Clerk. Councilor Adamson. Councilor Adamson, aye. Councillor Anay. Councillor Anay, aye. Councillor Barth. Councillor Barth, aye. Councillor Boots. Councillor Boots, aye. Councillor Brown. Councillor Brown, aye. Councillor Carlino. Councillor Carlino, aye. Councillor Dilk. Councillor Dilk, aye. Councillor Ethan Evans. Councillor Ethan Evans, aye. Councillor Jared Evans. Councillor Jared Evans, aye. Councillor Graves. Councillor Graves, aye. Councillor Gray. Councillor Gray. Councillor Hart. Michael Hart, aye. Councillor Holiday. Councillor Holiday, aye. Councillor Jackson. Councillor Jackson, aye. Councillor Johnson. Councillor Johnson, aye. Councillor Jones. Councillor Jones, aye. Councillor Lewis. Councillor Lewis, aye. Councillor Mascari. Councillor Mascari, aye. Councillor McCormick. Councillor McCormick, aye. Councillor Mowry. Councillor Mowry, aye. Councillor Oliver. Councillor Oliver, aye. Councillor Osley. Councillor Osley, aye. Councillor Potts. Councillor Potts, aye. 
Councillor Ray. Councillor Ray, aye. Councillor Robinson. Councillor Robinson, aye. Thank you, Mr. President. The vote is 24 to zero. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, the motion carries. The next item is proposal number 137, 2020, referred to the Committee of the Whole. I believe everyone has a copy of this proposal as well, which approves an additional appropriation totaling $2,089,455. In the 2020 budget of the Marion County Elections Board, County General and Cumulative Capital Funds, for the mailing of absentee applications, rental of additional express vote machines, and for the necessary equipment to run the Marion County elections of 2020. Is there a motion to adopt? President. Second. All right, so moved and seconded. The motion has been properly moved and seconded. Are there comments from councilors? Councilor Mowry. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question for this is, I get the need for more polling equipment, but I question whether we need to be sending out a $1.4 million mailer to absentee voters. Uh, I think we could better use our resources towards asking or requesting that folks send in a request for an absentee ballot before the May 21st deadline. I think with what we're doing right now, I think we're being a little bit irresponsible with taxpayers' money to spend this much money to mail it out. And I would hope that we could find a better way to use almost $1.4 million. And for that reason, I will be a no vote on this. Very good. Thank you. Um, Councillor Barth. And number two, we need to make sure we're making uh, the voting process as safe as possible. And I think our representative from the health department made that clear. So I appreciate this proposal and I am very much uh, in support. We'll be voting yes. Councilor Barth, unfortunately, I couldn't hear your first point. Would you repeat your first point? I think um, my overall point was, number one, that during this time, we need to do everything we can to support our citizens to exercise their right to vote. And I think this proposal does that. And number two, my broader point was that we need to make sure they do it in a way that's as safe as possible. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Additional comments from Councillors? Councillor Adams, please. Yeah. Councillor Adams, you're on mute. Councillor Adams, would you try that again? My, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask to, to be uh, added on as a co-sponsor for this proposal. I think, uh, as Councilor Barth had mentioned, uh, anything that we can do to encourage uh, uh, voting by our population, we ought to be doing, uh, especially in these uncertain times when people may have concerns about going out in public. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councilor Mascari. Yes, I'd like to be added as a um, co-sponsor also. The safety of everybody in the Indianapolis or Marion County is the most important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Additional comments? Councillor Hart. 
Uh, yeah, first thought before a comment, I had a, a question. Is there anybody here that are that is addressing questions pertaining to this this evening? Yes, um, uh, we have um, from the elections uh, elections office, uh, Brian uh, Delaney. All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, so, my first question is: Do we have enough storage space to accommodate all of these absentee ballots? Uh, President Osley, may I respond? Yes, please. Um, yes, we do. We have a large warehouse um, located at 3737 East Washington Street, um, where we've accommodated up to close to 100,000 um, absentee ballots in the past. So I believe that we can um, hold at least that many. And when counting those ballots, will we have enough room to maintain social distancing practices? For those individuals to keep them safe when counting? Um, the Indiana, yes, to answer your question um, in short, and also the Indiana Election Commission um, has, for this election, allowed us to move our counting operation to more than one location if we believe that's necessary. Um, so I think we're still working on that possibility, but I believe that we will have enough room. And are we getting any special posted rates for this? for being such a bulk program? Yes, we are. We are working with Rico, um, who has the city's contract for printing, um, and they are using their corporate discount, um, or I guess a corporate rate somehow um, for the postage. So we're paying less than 50 cents for the outgoing um, mail, and then we have a prearranged rate for the return mail. And are we doing anything, or is the state doing anything to help offset any of this cost due to uh, just the change of election day? As far, um, nothing is set in stone that I know of right now. I, I know that there's a lot of talk of them possibly providing um, PPE and hand sanitizer, things like that. There's also the federal CARES Act, supposedly some of that is supposed to come through to elections, but I have no um, direct knowledge of what will be coming uh, from the state or federal government at this time. Okay, and then did the election board have an opportunity to vote on sections two and three of this proposal? And if, if they did, what day did they do that? Um, the election board uh, did portions of the proposal that um, came under contract uh, for the new equipment um, that we purchased, they did vote on. Uh, as far as it, um, goes towards um, absentee ballot application, um, those funds, those were not voted on by the election board. Okay, so the, the funds weren't voted on. And then my final question before I have a comment is that I was told the mayor is addressing a letter and signing a letter inside of this uh, when the application goes out. Is that true? Um, the letter actually now is going to be coming from Marion County Clerk um, Myla Eldridge on Marion County Election Board letterhead. Um, so at this point, that's the letter that's been sent to the printer. And I um, do want to let everyone in the room know that we're finalizing the last details for the letter that will be the application. And it's my plan to send that to both the Marion County Republican Party and the Marion County Democratic Party with the contents of the letter, the application, um, the date that we expect it to start hitting mailboxes so that both parties um, can follow up with any chaser mail or anything that they want to do. Because um, I know there's a lot of effort being put into um, absentee applications. This election. So we do plan on communicating that hopefully tomorrow if I can get information from the printer so that everybody knows what's being communicated to the voters. I just go here. Thank you very much, Brian. And and I just want to follow up by saying that, you know, I, I can tell that Dr. Kane is trying to have a very conservative approach in, in keeping individuals safe. And, you know, that's that's ultimately my concern, right, is making sure that uh, Hoosiers are, are safe and healthy during this time. And, you know, ultimately, you know, we, we you know, we've, we're working on shrinking down voting locations and uh, updating the equipment. And I know some of those costs are, are inside of this request as well. And, you know, ultimately, what I'd like to see is the voter experience be the greatest it can be, and that all Indianapolis residents have the opportunity to express their right to vote. Um, what kind of pains me a little bit is is going out 
kind of far outside of the norm, right? And, and generally, voters request that ballot. Sending uh, out 634,000 pieces of mail to registered voters uh, without getting the request, I, I feel is a, a bit excessive in terms of cost when we're going into a, a period of time where a lot of folks are on unemployment and we know we're losing uh, income tax. And so I think a thousand or a million dollars could be used in a, a, a better way than just sending out a bunch of mail. And I think we could do a better job and wait for those requests to come in first. Um, so that's just where I'm at on it. But I appreciate, Brianne, you, you joining the conference tonight and explaining all those uh, answers that you gave. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Councillor uh, Jones. Thank you, President Osley. Um, I just want to say, um, especially, you know, in my district, I know the demographic of the voter is an, um, an older population. And I think following uh, Dr. Kane's lead, it is very crucial for us to protect this population. And I definitely will be voting yes for this proposal. Um, I think it is very, very important that um, for me, I, I know it is a lot of money and it is a price tag um, that we do have to look at, but it's very crucial to send this mailer out so that these, um, these residents can have the option to uh, receive this, this absentee ballot application and have the option to um, have this, um, by the time June 2nd rolls around, hopefully we're on the other side of this surge. And I feel that if we do not send this mailer out and give these residents this option, we're going to be taking two steps backwards. And we cannot do that in Marion County. And it's too dangerous. And I think this is not a partisan issue. This is a public safety issue. And we must follow Dr. Kane's uh, lead on this. And I, I am honored to stand beside her in this issue and vote yes. And I think it's crucial that as a council that we stand beside her in this and um, I'm honored to do so. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Um, uh, Councillor Jones. Uh, Councillor Ine, and then followed by Councillor Carlino. Councillor Ine. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to address uh, Proposal 137. Uh, when you take a look at it, th this is a primary. Uh, this is not a general election. A primary is a party-driven uh, uh, election. And so it would be a whole different story, in my opinion, if we were talking a general election. We are not. We are talking a primary. Um, or if you take a look, or we were talking about a situation in which absentee applications were being automatically mailed uh, to folks. A ballot was mailed to folks to, who had participated in the last several primaries, but folks who hadn't uh, had to request one. That's not happening here. So essentially, our city uh, will be... Um, spending $1.4 million on what fundamentally amounts to 60 people running in 20 uh, contested races. Um, so I'll be a no vote this evening. I would encourage my colleagues to do that. Okay, very good. Um, Councillor um, Councilor Carlino. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanna remind everybody that, um, you know, our, our vote machines are digital. Um, folks have to operate via touch screen and oftentimes that will require removing their hand PPE to vote. It will require between every vote um, the, the machinery to be cleaned, as Brianne was saying. So I think that um, $1.5 million to raise awareness and to save lives um, and allow folks for their, their voice and their vote to be heard um, is critical during this time. And so I'll be a yes vote tonight. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Councilor Mowry. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would like to add on. Um, I, actually, I want to start out with a question for Brianne Delaney. Uh, she said they were authorized for more than one for more than one facility for this election. Does that then come before us again for a rental usage of more than one facility? I was specifically referring to our central count um, of absentee ballots um, and it, just saying um, and the question came from Councillor Hart about whether we have enough room for facility and in the event we don't believe we have enough room, we could rent another facility or uh, I know that, um, you know, we have uh, public buildings on election day um, and those are required to be rent free. So uh, I think there's a lot of options that wouldn't require any additional expenses for that. 
So it, potentially, then you could be coming back to us for more money to rent one of those facilities. Likely not. Most of the costs for facilities rentals that we paid are fairly minimal. Um, and our, I believe our regular budget could withstand that type of rental, especially since our, um, you know, election day sites are likely to less this election. Um, so I think that our regular budget will be able to withstand that. Thank you. In closing, I, I just think that I can see the need for this in a general election. But folks, we are talking about a primary in a party election you are picking your candidate in a primary election we have folks that are going to fast food restaurants to pick up food we have folks i've been to a hardware store where i have come within close encounters of folks because they are packed i've been to city parks and they are packed we are talking about spending over a million dollars to help 20% of voters, which is historically what we get on a primary vote, vote to come out and make their cast their vote. A million dollars for 20% of the county. I think right now that this is a little much for us to spend on a primary. I can see at a general election spending this money. But right now, I think we need to be a little more fiscally responsible with the taxpayer's dollar. And for those reasons, I will be an absolute no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Brown. Allie Brown. Thank you, uh, President. Um, <laughs> there's a couple things I'd like to remind some of my colleagues, particularly my male colleagues. Uh, white women, frankly, uh, got the right to vote 100 years ago. And our uh, sisters of color, it's been even shorter. Voting is an essential right. When we talk about putting things, um, putting, eliminating barriers for people to vote, one of the things is with these absentee ballot applications is a wet signature, which means that people have to print these ballots off at home Absolutely, print the requests off at home in the government. Oops. Uh, sorry, print them off at home and send them in. Many people do not have printers at home, thus creating a barrier. I know that there are people out at parks and there are people out at the hardware store and things like that, but we're the body that's supposed to be discouraging those kinds of things right now and trying to keep people safe. And this is how we keep people safe. And I don't care if it's a primary election, I don't care if it's a general election. It's about keeping people safe and it's about allowing people to ex exercise their basic democratic rights. When it comes to money, we spend a lot of money on a lot of things in this city and making sure that the people in this city have their chance to vote, have the chance to make their voices heard in an election. And if we have to do this in November, make sure that they are able to, they know what they're doing now so they can do it in November is essential. Sending people to get in line to get sick because you wanna save a little bit of money is silly. It's silly and it's offensive. It's offensive to the people who, who vote in every election who now can't. My mother had a heart attack a week before lockdown. She's now with these people who's voted in every election of her entire life and is not able to go and stand in line at the polls. She needs that paper so she can do that. We have to think about the people who aren't us, who don't have the privilege to sit here and talk about how we can figure out a way to vote. I will be strongly supporting this love to be there as a co-sponsor because I believe that everyone deserves the right to vote. Removing barriers from allowing it, making it harder for them to be is essential in a democracy. Thank you. All right. Councillor uh, Ethan Evans. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just you know, wanted to uh, you know what my colleagues were saying about you know how Really, you know, it doesn't matter if it is a primary or a general, it's still an election and people have the right to vote. And we shouldn't be, you know, differentiating between the two. It's still an election and people are going to be voting in it. And we saw in Wisconsin, you know, what happened 
when people didn't take heed about that same thing in a primary. So how about we, I'm just saying that we could take um, a view of what happened there and not make a repetition of that mistake here in Indianapolis and to the view of that just 20 to 25 percent of people vote in the primary that's still over 120,000 people in the city of Indianapolis so yes I would like to protect over 100,000 people from potentially getting sick with COVID-19 if we had the chance to do so so that is just my point of view very good uh Councilor Jackson thank you Mr. President um, get my screen up here. Uh, there may not be a need to, this may not cost over a million. Some of this money of the million is allocated for the general election. If we're back on track by then from COVID, um, we may not need the mailer for, uh, the general election that may bring us down at a much lower rate of a half a million and then we may not need that half a million if folks don't return their ballot but here again i agree with some of my colleagues uh Councilor carlino and jones and some of you others that have spoken and spoken very well and um ali Councilor brown very passionate you know this is unprecedented times and unprecedented times we need to do unprecedented things as leaders of the people and be a voice for the people. And I say at this time, we be we stand up and we stand united for those people. Uh, we take under the leadership and the guidance of Dr. Virginia Kane, and she's advised us. We all heard the same message. She asked us if possible. She had, what I heard from her is what she said most foremost is to keep her, her concern is the June 2nd election. That's the first thing I heard her say is her election is her concern is that election and keeping people away from those polls so if she is the head of our health department and as her expertise i take that very seriously it was what she's done under her leadership under many years here in marion county if this is one of her major concerns if we as the 25 bodies of this counselor under our leadership and our professionalism can help her do one thing with a half a million dollars or less is to help keep people safe and, and, and provide them to democracy and something that they are due owed. I think we as leaders of this city should do it. I think we should stand up and do it well and do it as a united front. I urge my colleagues to do the same thing and vote yes. To proposal 137 tonight. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, very good. Thank you very much. Um, Councilor Jared Evans. Yes. And I'm sorry, Mr. President, and I'd like yes. to be added Thank to co sponsors. This is Councilor right. Jackson. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilor Evans. Jared Evans. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, a couple of comments right here. First, I want to echo the sentiment that uh, Councilor Ethan Evans just made about Wisconsin. That's what's been on my mind is that we're not duplicating a repeat here in Indianapolis. And the other comment is from Councilor Kristen Jones uh, talking about our elderly population. I represent the second oldest district uh, in our city. And when we talk about that population of people who are going to vote, even though it is a primary, it is typically the older generations that are showing up and voting. And these are the people who are the most susceptible to getting this virus and having the illness. So it is about protection. And Mr. President, I'm just gonna be blunt and say it. This smells political to me, which is absolutely ridiculous because it shouldn't be, it is a health issue for our city. And so I hope as my colleagues are thinking about this, we're, we're, we're doing what's right based on our citizens and, and not on a wallet not about being physically conservative. We're trying to make sure that we don't spread this, that we don't hurt more people or cause people to die. And the long-term effects of this could be detrimental to the economy of the city anyways, if we allow in-person voting and, and people spreading this virus. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Jones. Um, thank you, President Osley. Um, I would also like to be added as a co-sponsor. And then can I ask Brianne an, a question? Please. Um, Brian, 
it, is it correct that there will also be a stamp on that envelope for them to mail the um, application back in? There will be a paid postage mark um, and the county will only be paying for mail that actually gets mailed back. Okay, so it also, and also that will also help keep people out of the post office. So if they had requested a ballot, as Councillor Mallory is suggesting they do, then they would have to go to the post office to get postage to mail that back. So also what we're doing is keeping our constituents and residents out of the post office by doing it this way. So we're keeping them out and helping in social distancing. So by doing it this way, it's also helping people by keeping them home, keeping them safe by doing it this way. So it's also twofold. So thank you, Grant. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Very good. Councillor Ane. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd just like to, to again uh, reiterate, and I would just start out by saying some of the what I would consider fear mongering that I've heard this evening is, is very unfortunate. But I would just like to say that uh, so the, these uncharted territories that we find ourselves in uncharted waters, um, they require some additional uh, steps. That is why the state of Indiana moved the primary from May 5 to June the 2nd and changed the rules to allow for no excuse absentee voting. So no voter needs uh, no voter needs a reason to vote absentee. And with that, again, I'll just turn it back over, Mr. President, and I'll be voting no. Very good. Councilor Potts. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'll be brief. It's, it's not lost on me that we are going to vote on proposal number 137 after we just passed additional funding for refrigerated units for the influx of deceased neighbors that our city has already experienced and will continue to experience. The, the price of our neighbor's public health is not something I am personally willing to negotiate on. And so to me, it doesn't matter what primary voter turnout is, but if we as a body can take any action that would allow even one person to remain home and stay safe in this unprecedented time, rather than showing up to a polling place and putting themselves in danger. I'm going to support it, and I hope my colleagues do as well. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council. All right, I don't see any more um, hands. Madam Clerk, were there any questions written in on proposal number 137? No, there were no questions or comments. All right, fellow counselors. Seeing no one here in the audience, if there are no additional comments, we will proceed to our vote. Madam Clerk. Councilor Adamson. <sighs> Councilor Adamson. Councilor Adamson, you are on mute. Councilor Ad Adamson? Councilor Adamson, aye. Councilor Ane? Councilor Ane, nay. Councilor Barth? Councilor Barth, aye. Councilor Boots? Councilor Boots, aye. Councilor Brown? Councilor Brown, aye. Councilor Carlino? Councillor Carlino, aye. Councillor Dilk. Councillor Dilk, nay. Councillor Evans. Ethan Evans. Councillor Ethan Evans, aye. Councillor Jared Evans. Councillor Jared Evans, aye. Councillor Graves. Uh, Councillor Graves, yes. Councillor Gray. Councillor Gray. Councillor Hart. Councillor Hart, aye. Councillor Holliday. Councillor Holliday, nay. Councillor Jackson. Councillor Jackson, aye. Councillor Johnson. Councillor Johnson, aye. Councillor Jones. Councillor Jones, aye. Councillor Lewis. 
Councilor Lewis, aye. Councilor Mascari. Councilor Mascari, aye. Councilor McCormick. Councilor McCormick. Councilor Mowry. Councilor Mowry, nay. Councilor Oliver. Councilor Oliver, aye. Councilor Osley. Councilor Osley, aye. Councilor Potts. Councilor Potts, aye. Councilor Ray. Councilor Ray. Councilor Robinson. Councilor Robinson, aye. President Osley, I have, I believe, 18 I and four nay. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion carries. There is no business under special orders. I'm finished business. The next item on our agenda is special orders final adoption. Proposal number 90 referred to public, uh, the Public Works Committee. Chairman Adamson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm experiencing technical difficulties or not. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Very good. With consent, I would like to take proposals number 90 through 97 together. Consent. 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 Thank you. Proposal consent. 90, 2020 authorizes speed limit reductions to 25 miles per hour. Nor Raleigh and Ro Rosal Rosen Roseberry Common Subdivision in District 2. Proposal number 91 authorizes intersection controls at Foxfire Drive and Shadow Brook Drive in District 6. Proposal number 92 authorizes intersection controls along Hendricks Place between Washington and New York Streets in District 17. Proposal number 93 authorizes turn restrictions on 34th and Pennsylvania Streets in the proximity of Short Ridge High School in District 9. Proposal number 94 authorizes speed limit reduction to 25 miles per hour in the Franklin Terrace, Franklin Park Estates Division District 25. Proposal number 95 authorizes speed limit reduction to 25 miles per hour in the Middle Farm Subdivision, District 1. Proposal number 96 authorizes intersection controls at Wooter and uh, Southern Avenues in District 15. And proposal number 97 authorizes intersection controls at Horner and Meadow, Meadow Drives in District 15. Councilor Oliver moves, seconded by Councilor Boots, to send proposal numbers 90 through 97 to the full council with a due pass recommendation and that motion carried by a vote of 11 to zero and I so move. Second. Second. The motion is improperly moved and seconded. Are there additional comments from councilors? Seeing none, we will proceed to our vote. Madam Clerk. Councillor Adamson. Councillor Adamson, aye. Councillor Anne. Councillor Anne, aye. Councillor Barth. Councillor Barth, aye. Councillor Boots. Councillor Boots, aye. Councillor Brown. Councillor Brown, aye. Councillor Carlino. Councillor Carlino, aye. Councilor Dilk. Councilor Dilk, aye. Councilor Ethan Evans. Councilor Ethan Evans, aye. Councilor Jared Evans. Councilor Jared Evans, aye. Councilor Graves. Councilor Graves, aye. Councilor Gray. Councilor Gray. Councilor Hart. Michael Hart. Aye. Councilor Hart. Michael Hart, aye. Councilor Holliday. Councilor Holliday, aye. Councilor Jackson. Councilor Jackson, aye. Councilor Johnson. Councilor Johnson, aye. Councilor Jones. Councilor Jones, aye. Councilor Lewis. 
Councillor Lewis, aye. Councillor Mascari. Councillor Mascari, aye. Councillor McCormick. Aye, Councillor McCormick, aye. Councillor Mowry. Councillor Mowry, aye. Councillor Oliver. Councillor Oliver, aye. Councillor Osley. Councillor Osley, aye. Councillor Potts. Councillor Potts, aye. Councillor Ray. Councillor Ray is having technical difficulty. He's an aye. Councillor Robinson, thank you. Councillor Robinson, aye. Thank you, Mr. President. That's 23. 23 yay and 2-9. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion carries. The next item on our agenda is proposal number 102, referred to Rules and Public Policy Committee. Chairman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. Proposal number 102, amend section 151-23 of the code regarding council committees. Chair Ossley stated that the Rules and Public Policy Committee is one of three permanent committees of the council and the proposed amendment would allow for the appointment of more than eight councilors as the code currently prescribes. Councilor Johnson moves seconded by Councilor Robinson to send proposal number 102 2020 to the full council with a due pass recommendation. Motion carried by vote of seven to zero. Mr. President, I so move. Thank you, uh, Chairman Johnson. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Are there any comments from councilors on proposal number 102? All right, seeing none, we will proceed to our vote. Madam Clerk. Councilor Adamson. Councilor Adamson. Councilor Adamson. Um, can you can you speak? I'm a yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ane. <laughs> Councillor Ane, aye. Councillor Barth. Councillor Barth, aye. <laughs> Councillor Boots. Councillor Boots, aye. Councillor Brown. Councilor Brown, aye. Councilor Carlino. Councilor Carlino, aye. Councilor Dilk. Councilor Dilk, aye. Councilor Ethan Evans. Councilor Ethan Evans, aye. Councilor Jared Evans. Councilor Jared Evans, aye. Councilor Graves. Councilor Graves, aye. Councilor Gray. Councilor Hart. Michael Hart, aye. Councilor Holliday. Councilor Holliday, aye. Councilor Jackson. Councilor Jackson, aye. Councilor Johnson. Councilor Johnson, aye. Councilor Jones. Councilor Jones, aye. Councilor Lewis. Councilor Lewis, aye. Councilor Mascari. Councilor Mascari, aye. Councilor McCormick. Hi, Councilmember McCormick. I and uh, Madam Clerk, can you please uh, on for one thirty-seven that I'm I as well? I internet. There's an echo. Councilor Mowry. Councilor Mowry. Aye. Councilor Oliver. Councilor Oliver, aye. Councilor Osley. Councilor Osley, aye. 
Councillor Potts. Councillor Potts, aye. Councillor Ray. Councillor Ray. Councillor Robinson. Councillor Robinson, aye. Mr. President, that is 23 to zero. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion carries. There is no business under special service district councils. Um, there is no business under new business. Um, the next item on agenda is announcements and adjournment. I believe that Councillor Oliver has something that he wishes to say. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, to all councillors, I want to acknowledge, uh, I was asked to acknowledge by the general public that the witness the volunteerism by the councillors all over the city. And uh, I happened to be at one last week at 21st in Arlington where we put together the food baskets. So I, I, I thank you to all the councillors that are doing all that they do. Also, the acknowledgement of the fallen officer. I don't know what the memorial route would be this coming Thursday, but I hope that uh, some of you will be able to join with me and many others on that memorial route. If not, uh, certainly, at the entrance to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So, so more to detail with that, we coming forward in the next 24 hours, where we're gonna be at and what memorial route they would be taking heading towards the speedway. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, thank you very much. The docketed agenda for this meeting of council having been completed, the chair will now entertain motions for adjournment. Mr. President. Chair recognizes Councilor Maury. Mr. President, I have been asked to offer the following motion for adjournment by all counselors in memory of IMPD officer Van Lee, by all counselors in memory of Thomas Popchev, by all counsel, by Councilor Jones in memory of Donna Jane Gable, by Councilor Holiday in memory of Jack Butler, by Councilors Boots and Potts, in memory of Mary Holland, by Councillor Boots, in memory of Paul Logan. Mr. President, I would like to move the adjournment of this meeting of the City of the Indianapolis City County Council in recognition of and respect for the life and contributions of those persons I have specifically named. I respectfully ask the support of fellow councillors. I further request the motion be made part of the permanent records of this body and that a letter bearing the council seal and the signature of the president be sent to the family of each person advising of this action. Thank you, Councillor Mowry. Hearing no objections, the motion is received and the request is so ordered. Hearing no further motions, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>